Bonjour à tous. Bienvenue au, uh, à l'Amphithéâtre national de la presse. So we're going to have a background briefing uh, en préparation de la conférence de Paris sur le climat. Uh, we're going to start with a short declaration by uh, Ms. May and then open the floor to questions. Uh, could you please shut down your cell phones, please? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, merci tout le monde d'être ici aujourd'hui. Uh, je pense que c'est une bonne idée d'avoir un peu de backgrounder. Ce n'est pas une conférence de presse, presse ce n'est pas les, 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 uh, les priorités du Parti vert. C'est seulement comme je suis un professeur. So at this point, what I want to do is help reporters who are likely to be covering COP21 understand some of the background context because it's critical in these negotiations that the Canadian public be informed, and uh, you're the front line in helping make that happen. So I'm going to try to be very brief. I want to cover three areas briefly and then go to your questions. The first is, what's a COP? <laughs> okay? So starting at the beginning, the beginning really is 1988 in Canada, first international scientific conference on climate. Uh, we then moved to the UN system where there was a decision to have, by the way, 1988 is the year they formed the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, having scientists available to advise policymakers. So in the ni late 1980s, 1989, the UN General Assembly said we will convene a conference in 1992 to address the threats of environment development. At that conference, the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, and I will not go through it, but there were de detailed and difficult negotiations between 1990 and 1992 to come up with the convention. The Framework Convention on Climate Change, la conférence, uh, uh, le, la convention cadre des Nations Unies sur les changements climatiques. En français, CCNUCC, in English, FCCCC, Framework Convention on Climate Change. Once that treaty entered into force, being signed and ratified by enough countries, that created an annual meeting. If you will, it's like an annual parliament on climate. It's called the Conference of the Parties. That's COP. COP 3 was in Kyoto, Japan, and put targets into the treaty that were legally binding. COP 11 was in Montreal. That was the first COP where Kyoto Protocol had also entered into force. So you will note when you're looking at UN documents that this convention is referred to as COP 21 and CMP 11. That refers to 21st Conference of the Parties of the Framework Convention on Climate Change and 11th meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol. So the only time Canada hosted a COP, it was in 2005, it was COP 11, CMP 1 just to get, you know, try to decipher some of the coded language. Every COP has been difficult. Uh, they are hard to describe to people who have never attended one. Uh, they are not lofty speeches. It is not a summit. It is not a lot of people standing around talking about climate change. It is painstaking, mind-numbing negotiation of text. So to give you a sense of it, and it's also extremely physical, that's one thing I wanted to, to share with you is a lot of people, and particularly in social media, say, well, why are all you people who care about climate flying places all the time for conferences? This meeting is so physical. You have to be in the same place to sort out a deal. The best example I wanted to share with you was at the end of COP11 in Montreal on a, the wee hours of a Saturday morning. COP is usually showed on all of your UN documents to end on a Friday. Hint, it doesn't end on a Friday. If any of you are planning to be there to cover the end of the negotiations, don't plan on leaving Paris till Sunday or Monday. They never end on Friday. So COP 11 in Montreal was going badly, then it was saved, and then the US backed down on something they've been insisting on on a Friday afternoon. Everything looked great. And suddenly, Russia came up with an objection that no one had expected, that they'd never mentioned before. All through the night, our Prime Minister at the time, Paul Martin, was calling Putin. Our UN Ambassador was calling their UN Ambassador. Our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Pierre Pettigrew, was calling their Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was, everybody at the higher level said in Russia, we don't want this stuck, we'll unstick it. So this is how physical it gets. At 5 o'clock in the morning, I think, maybe 5.30, Pierre Pettigrew gets a call on his cell phone. 
It's his counterpart in Moscow, Minister of Foreign Affairs, saying, I need you to find me my delegation. They have turned off their cell phones. So there's an image for you, Pierre Pettigrew wandering through a convention center, holding his cell phone, trying to find Russians to say, I've got your boss on the phone. That's literally how COP11 got unstuck. What happens in the corridors, information sharing, it's very tricky negotiations. And it's not in one room. The plenary is in one room where ministers come and make speeches. But the negotiations are in different rooms, and there are at any given time at least eight different issues being negotiated. Now, I had the text put on the screen for you, and I hope you can see it. It's, this is the draft text that emerged from the last session of negotiation, which was October 19th, the day of our federal election, till October 23rd. Canada was still negotiating, negotiating under instructions from the previous government. This text emerged slimmed down from what it had been in February. In February, it had been almost 80 pages. It's now 54 pages. I want you to look at, just looking at uh, the first few paragraphs that are up on the screen, what you'll note is that even in the, in first, the second paragraph, it says, in furtherance and pursuit. Note that there's square brackets around furtherance and square brackets around pursuit. That means COP21 has to sort out whether we're going to say furtherance or pursuit. It's in contention. Anything in square brackets is not yet agreed. Of the objective brackets, principles and provisions, as set out, etc. Taking into account particular vulnerabilities. Everything you see in square brackets is not yet agreed upon. Uh, Deborah, can you go to page 3, Article 2? I want to show you the discussion and where we are on what the goals of the convention are. Because here we have, let me just get to it, uh, the key, of the key to the agreement is trying to hold global average temperature increase to below 2 degrees Celsius. In option 1, and again you can see square brackets throughout, you can't look at this text without seeing square brackets everywhere you look. A, hold the increase in global average temperature, square brackets, below 2 degrees, below 1.5 degrees, well below 2 degrees, below 2.2 degrees or 1.5 degrees, etc as far below two degrees Celsius as possible, all in square brackets. So the convention parties, all 196 of them, because there's 195 countries plus the European Union. So if you're trying to decode, what do we mean? I see some places 196 parties, I see other places 195 countries, 195 countries plus the EU. Haven't agreed on exactly how we express this. I mean, clearly, it's recognized that there's a red line and that no one wants to see, no one, not 195 countries in the EU, want to see global average temperature above 2 degrees. But 2 degrees is not a safe zone, nor is it a political target. It's a statement of what scientists believe can avoid catastrophic levels of climate change of the order that destroy human civilization. So you, you can go through this, and I, I won't take you through what we used to do in theology with a sort of a exegesis of the text word by word. It's pretty mind-numbing, but I do want Deborah to turn to page 27, Article 17, if we can find that. Uh, this treaty is not, at this point, likely to be legally binding on anyone, which is extremely worrying and dangerous. Uh, the legally binding aspect of treaties was thrown off the rails in Copenhagen. The multilateral, that was in, to refresh your memories, 2009, COP15, when our previous prime minister actually attended the negotiations. Uh, the Copenhagen Accord, so-called, was not a product of UN negotiations, it was negotiated mm. offline. So Article 17 is what remains of calling anything legally binding. And the only option to have this treaty be legally binding at all is in square brackets under option one of Article 17. Now, it's, it's very clear that there are multiple issues still to be negotiated at this COP. You've probably seen from any cursory examination of what's going on, concern about financing, concern about two different concepts, uh, assisting developing countries to adapt to levels of climate change, as well as reimbursing developing countries for what they lose in what's called a concept of loss and damage which is basically like saying the industrialized world are arsonists, you just burned down my house, you have to pay for the house. 
That's the north-south dynamic of loss and damage. It's new. It only came up for the first time at the, uh, it was first injected in the Warsaw COP when the Philippines came straight from Typhoon Haiyu and said, look, look what's happening to us. So that would have been uh, COP 19 Warsaw, right, COP 20 Lima, COP 21, here we are, Paris. Uh, the other piece I wanted, I said three pieces, the history, the ups and downs, the text, and the last thing I want to cover is what is the world expecting of a new Canadian government? Some of you may have listened in yesterday to a very good press briefing by the policy wonk experts. I am not a policy wonk expert at the level of Jennifer Morgan at World Resources Institute, although I've worked with her for years. And it was interesting to her, hear her giving a summary of what's expected at COP21 to international journalists. So they were there from all around the world listening in. You can find it online under World Resources Institute and listen to that press briefing if you want to. I think the only Canadian reporter whose voice I heard was Sean McCarthy at Globe. But what she said is, you know, right now the Globe, uh, Brazil is being very helpful. That's a good sign. The EU is trying, but it's got a real problem with Poland. Yes. And what's the new Canada going to do? So that was the order of her hierarchy of things that could shift the negotiations in Paris. What will not the new Canada, she just said, what will new Canada do? What are they going to do? So the, uh, the way that the treaty is now structured involves what are called intended nationally determined contributions, which is a package of measures including what target a country is committed to, how much fine, that is a target in terms of reduced emissions, uh, financing, what money is the, is that country from an industrialized position prepared to put on the table, given that, again, back to the disaster in Copenhagen, from which we are still suffering, uh, former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and then President Barack Obama promised developing countries that by 2020 there would be a global fund to help them adapt to the climate crisis of $100 billion every year available to developing countries. This was not an ask from developing countries, but it has become part of the architecture of this treaty to make sure there's $100 billion every year available from public and private sources for the poorer countries. At the time, again, more narrative and the color and drama of the moment, when that was brought back to the conference, or to the, the, the actual COP from a hotel room in a back room where Barack Obama struck this deal, the delegation of Tuvalu said, our future is not for sale. We don't want your 30 pieces of silver. There was a deadlock, and we did not end up with the Copenhagen Accord being an agreed upon agreement of that COP. That's why it was changed through getting it back on the rails in Cancun at COP 16 and so on. We have limped along. The document that's there on the screen is literally the product of four years of negotiations. And what will happen at COP21, especially in light of the terrorist attacks now, we know that we will be behind essentially a fortress within which hundreds of negotiators, thousands of negotiators, will be pouring through this text. I can tell you right now that in capitals around the world, you will find that there are bureaucrats and diplomats who think that their future career and the fate of their country depends on removing square brackets on one piece of text. And getting to a conclusion involves all of these moving parts being aligned like a Rubik's Cube. If the weakest possible treaty comes through, it won't be worth the paper it's written on. If the strongest possible treaty comes through, we'll be in good shape to substantially decarbonize the global economy by 2050. In this mix, Canada has a huge role to play, which is why I am impatient with cynicism and dumping on the new government before they have a chance to actually put together a new package, show up with a better position. I would urge that the Canadian government consider re-ratifying the Kyoto Protocol, come to Paris with new targets that are deeper. Hopefully, the premiers, who will be here on Monday, will give our new prime minister some latitude to set a more aggressive target for emissions reductions and know that when we get back from Paris, we'll work out the details and that we also have a substantial commitment on financing. The other key piece that I shouldn't uh, move to questions without mentioning is that this whole new approach, since the Kyoto approach got trashed in Copenhagen, 
we now have a, an approach of pledge and review. Every country is going to make their own pledge. It's not binding in the treaty. Even if the treaty becomes legally binding, the individual pledges of individual countries are not legally binding. So what we have is a whole list of what countries plan to do. The essence of when you hear people saying we want to get the architecture right in this treaty, what they're talking about is having an enforced, and how you force it if it's not legally binding, I'll leave to you, and enforced every five years all countries agree to say this is how far we've gone so far, this is what the science tells us we need to do, we're a long way from doing what we need to do, every five years let's ramp up. One closing thought is that yesterday's comments by Stéphane Dion that he did not think this treaty would avoid two degrees is not an opinion on his point part, nor is he being pessimistic. He's stating what everybody knows. The current cumulative agreed upon INDCs from the 140 or so countries that have pledged, reviewed by scientists, if all of those pledges were realized, everybody keeps their promises, the world global average temperature increases to between 2.7 degrees Celsius to 3.7 degrees Celsius above pre-industrialized levels. So everybody recognizes that the targets are not yet good enough, which is why they're talking about a pledge and review every five years to increase. And the, F the hope is that as countries realize, gee, we're reducing greenhouse gases, our economy is doing better, we're creating more jobs, new technologies are available, this is way easier than we thought, we can accelerate how much we reduce. Personally, I would be much more comfortable if the totality of INDCs as of the opening of COP, or certainly by the closing of COP21, uh, get us to a range where we're below, at least below three. I mean, to have a treaty that we're talking about achieving as a success which where we know going into it, as Stéphane Dion said, which is completely obvious to anyone who's been tracking this at all, the cumulative effort currently being pledged is far too weak. So I'm sorry I went on a little long. That's uh, but, oh, happy to answer questions. I should tell you, the pieces that I copied for you, if you want to take away hard copy, this is an extremely good package from the non-government organizations in Canada. Climate Action Network has put together what they think is doable for Canada. So this is advice to the Prime Minister. I think it's a useful, clear document, so I want it for you. And I copied out this in French, en français aussi anglais. This is a product of a Canadian NGO called, it's the International Institute for Sustainable Development, produces Earth Negotiations Bulletin. If you're not going to Paris, but you want to track what's happening every single day, this little outfit, ENB Reporting Services, does a brilliant job condensing every single day's negotiations to two pages. This is longer because it's a summary of everything that happened at the last negotiation in Bonn. It also conveniently has a glossary. So if you find yourself reading a document and thinking, oh my gosh, nobody ever told me about LMDCs. What the heck are LMDCs? You can look it up. Anyway, thanks. Good, so. Questions? Joanna Smith, Toronto Star. Thank you. Thanks, for, thanks uh, Ms. May. This was helpful. Um, I just want to ask you, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the decision by, by this federal government not to go in with a, a clear national target. They've talked about how they don't think the, the existing one can achieve by harbor is adequate, but given no real sense of what. Does that, how does that impact negotiations, do you think? It doesn't hurt negotiations, but it doesn't help negotiations. I'm very, very strongly of the view that Prime Minister Trudeau has the potential, and Canada therefore has the potential, to vastly improve the treaty that will come out of Paris. So I have not heard them say since the election that they will definitely not improve the target. I heard Minister of Environment and Climate Change Catherine McKenna say we probably won't have a new target. The reality is, and it's a harsh reality for a new government, that Canada does have targets going into COP21. They are Harper's targets. They are on in the UN Secretariat as tabled. That's Canada. They're not labeled Harper, they're labeled Canada. So Canada has the weakest targets of any country in the G8. It's not good. We can vastly improve on those. We can do it before Paris. 
And the thing that gives me some hope is that the Liberal platform on climate never mentioned an intention to bring premiers together between the election and COP. The platform said we will invite the premiers to come to Paris with us. It did not say we will have a meeting November 23rd and hope we can maybe come up with something better over dinner. So Canada's current target, just to refresh your memory, is 30 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. Uh, it's uh, very weak. Uh, and we, I think it, at a minimum, we could advance it by five years and be on the same target as um, uh, Obama. The U.S. target is 28 percent below 2005 by 2025. Advancing our current target by five years is quite doable. It's not nearly as ambitious as what the Green Party platform was. But it would be a good signal to the world. So would re-ratifying Kyoto. To give the negotiations, which will last two weeks, some real impetus. So. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau speaking at the very beginning. This is unusual, by the way. Usually the first week of negotiations is all diplomats, not even ministers, lower level grunt negotiators, not to speak disparagingly of the negotiators. They work awfully hard. The high level segment usually takes place starting the Tuesday of the second week. And high level segment is when you get heads of government and ministers. So it's very unusual that heads of government have decided to come November 30th and December 1st at the very opening. This gives Prime Minister Trudeau a unique, uh, historically unprecedented opportunity to show up and kickstart the whole show to better results by improving.